It is Tim and Sally and a car. Since the 1960s, there have been dramatic changes in the electronic media that children have learned to use inside and outside school. As these technologies have become more complex, they have come to play an ever-increasing part in children's lives, raising questions about their impact on social and intellectual development. Are they encouraging a generation of social isolates? Do they have the potential to change the way children think? And what contribution is psychology making to our understanding of the effects of these new media? I like it better than watching cartoons because of, well, you can control the characters and it's just like you making your own cartoon up with the characters. I think it makes you feel good that like you're doing well on something. And also, on Echo the Dolphin, it's not really getting the scores, it's rescuing dolphins and rescuing your friends. And, you know, it makes you feel happy. <laughs> It's got a girl in it as well called um, Chanley, and that's why most girls play her, especially. And also in this game, they've made her one of the best players. They made her faster than all of the others. They've made her have special moves which are better. Children's engagement in new technology poses a challenge to adults. The temptation is either to dismiss it as trivial or to worry about its compulsive appeal. If they were doing something simple, repetitive all the time, then they get very quickly bored. It's because it offers them a whole range of possibilities that they enjoy what they think is the fantasy of it because it's all about power and control and being in control. Which, of course, if you're a child, is the one thing you long to be. <laughs> I find it quite interesting that when children become very devoted to activities such as chess or reading or whatever, parents and teachers tend to praise them. But somehow there is a suspicion about new technology, which has gone on from generation to generation. Um, the telephone was supposed to make you go deaf. Travelling at more than 20 miles an hour in a train was supposed to make the human body disintegrate. <laughs> I think there's moral panic about anything that people don't understand well. The same moral panic, the same things were actually said about television in the 1950s. And many, many research projects were initiated then to look at exactly the same things. Is it going to create a nation of recluses who don't interact, who don't play with each other, who don't talk to each other? Children are making alternative worlds all the time. That's what they do when they tell stories. In some ways, what I see in the new technology are new folk tales, which are shared because they, they do share the same video games, the same video tracks. What people worry about is in case they lose themselves in a world and stop having contact what they, with what they call reality. I think that's unlikely for the normal child. Contrary to public myths, I actually found that children who were the more introverted uh, type, who actually went into new technology, playing computer games or programming, whatever, actually increased their social circles. Um, they now had street credibility, people came to them for advice, how do I get to the next level on, the, on this game or whatever. Um, many children are still very suspicious of new technology, so they, were the, they acted as gurus to these children. 
Concerns about the social effects of the new technologies go hand in hand with concerns about their effects on children's intellectual development. For instance, the concern about the time taken up that could be spent on reading. The speed of technological change also means that each new generation of children is faced with dramatically different experiences to those of their parents and teachers. I often think that in schools at the moment we have the Andy Pandy generation leading the, uh, leading the MTV generation forward and it's illustrative I think to look back on Andy Pandy and look at the way that those programs were. The pace is astonishingly slow when you show them. Uh, it takes 20 seconds for the flower to open at the beginning of uh, the program. Uh, you get the credits, um, then you get uh, a narrative tune, then you get an introduction. You only get one thing at a time. It's got no pace to it at all, uh, and yet in the context that maybe we all listen to it, which is often in a darkened room with the curtains drawn and a small screen in the corner, uh, it was appropriate and it was the single focus of our attention. Andy Pandy's playing somewhere very special today. Let's go and find him, shall we? There he is. Hello, Andy Pandy. What we find now Hello. are children who can be comfortable with a much, much busier screen. If you watch pop videos, if you watch current advertisements, you'll find often 20-second advertisements with 25 uh, or more video edits clipped into their, into their brevity. You'll find story, narrative, character, plot and place packed into 10 seconds of the advertisement. Uh, and children are adept at handling that. And remember that the television is now in a bright and illuminated room and is only a tiny window in a much bigger social context. So I think children have become much more efficient information handlers. Whether they're learning more from, from, from that um, more comfortable handling of information, I think is a very big question. And it's a question that desperately needs better and higher quality and long-term research. How children learn from technology has been most fully explored in the world of education. Each generation of school children has come to terms with new uses for technology that have been shaped by the prevailing theory of learning and development. In the early 60s, it was behaviorism and the teaching machine, promoted by B.F. Skinner, one of the most famous psychologists of the period. Professor Skinner found that by using a special procedure, he could teach pigeons and rats quite complex sequences of behavior. Here, the pigeon is first trained to approach the food bin when he hears a click and sees a light come on inside the tray. The food is then available for two and a half seconds. He learns this very quickly, and the light and click are then established as the signals to come and eat. Machines are patient and reliable. The same fixed procedures can be repeated again and again until the animal has learned them. Applying the same techniques to children says something about the way we think they learn and make sense of the world around them. It is Tim and Sally and the car. Skinner's main approach to psychology as a science was to reject concepts of mind so that we couldn't talk about th thoughts, couldn't talk about feelings, we couldn't talk about imagination uh, and so on. So it was natural for Skinner to look at the teaching machine as a way of delivering perfect instruction uh, to young children. The dog barks. As the designer of the system, you could set up the stimuli, you could uh, fix the reinforcement schedules, you could monitor responses and decide when a response was established so that you could go on to the next step. The dog barks at the car. There is no reason why a, a, a boy should solve an equation to be to gain approval. It isn't why mathematicians solve equations. There's no reason why the child should, should solve them for that reason. You solve an equation in order to go on and do something else. And that's what, exactly what happens with a well-prepared program. You are progressing, you're moving, you have a sense of you're accomplishing something. This is all done uh, for kinds of, of reinforcers which do not involve uh, personal contact. I would, I'm all for getting uh, the personal touch out of mathematics because it shouldn't be there. Nothing about mathematics that involves the personal touch. I've always felt the problem with the behaviorist approach to learning is not that it's simply wrong, it's just that it's a very impoverished kind of language we're talking about learning. Um, and, and the key ingredients to that language were reinforcement 
Uh, and there is a basic insight there. It is useful often to attend to the consequences of what people do if you want to understand what they're going to do in the future or what they might have learned. Uh, so that's not a bad idea, which obviously doesn't take you very far. Study after study, investigation after investigation, uh, produced evidence which was, was counter to these theoretical claims. So that, for example, it soon became evident that there are individual differences uh, in, if you like, learning styles, that some children don't want to go through small step fixed sequences. Uh, some children sometimes want to take, uh, test a hypothesis which takes them several steps ahead. Some children like to work from the general and go to the particular. Other like to work from the particular to the general. So I think behaviorism gave way to cognitive psychology, with, to the widespread realization that unless we could have some theory about what the mental processes are, uh, which underlie these individual differences, uh, then there's no way in which we could facilitate the learning process. A baby of the computer age. By typing any four keys, the horse appears. For her, it's a plaything, but her education and development will be transformed by it. Will she be programmer or programmed? Twenty years on from the teaching machine came perhaps the most radical vision of how technology could support children's intellectual development. Seymour Papert's work with the programming language Logo. Using the language, children could maneuver a device called a turtle to explore mathematical and geometrical concepts. The computer offers us a chance to reorganize the way we learn. Instead of being given knowledge by a hierarchy of experts, we can get it for ourselves, building it from scratch with the computer as our workbench. Here, the turtle is an arrowhead. There's the arrow, as you can see it. And that's where the turtle is. Yeah. We call it Seymour clearly. <laughs> um, we named it after um, a person that invented Logo. And he was seen I tend more and more to avoid that word education. It makes one think of doing something to the child, educating the child. The most important parts are in relationship, in play, in social forms, in art, in sensibility to aesthetics. All this is part of the developing individual and the computer enters into all of that. Well, if Skinner's work with teaching machines illustrates behaviorism, then Papert's work with these micro-worlds like Logo are a very vivid demonstration of how Piaget's psychology can be translated into educational practice. And the important thing for us to do is to provide resources and an environment and a setting in which they can, by their own activity, discover the things that they need to know. And so the, the Logo micro-world was a vehicle of this sort. I mean, it was a tool with which children could explore mathematical ideas and do so from a base of their own interest and their own engagement and their own curiosity. Objects whizzing around the screen give this generation of children experience never before available. Children learn by experience of the world around them. That was the message of the Swiss educationist Jean Piaget. And hearing it, schools brought everyday objects into the classroom, creating a revolution in the education of young children. Crayon, glue, cardboard, blocks. These are the standard building materials from which children build their minds. Papert worked with Piaget and realized that the computer should come in along with the mud pies.